Good evening and thank you for joining us. Politicians and union leaders are reacting to the news about major layoffs at Thunder Bay's Alstom plant. As we first told you on yesterday's news hour, more than 300 of the plant's 400 workers will be off work for anywhere from four months to a year. The Unifor president thinks those lay layoffs could have been avoided by awarding provincial contracts sooner. Cory Nordstrom has more. It's a poor situation we're in right now. And unfortunately, uh, I believe that it could have been avoided. According to Dominic Pasqualino, the first series of cutbacks will begin March 21st at Thunder Bay's Alstom plant. The phases of layoffs will continue until July, with some workers being called back in August. That's when work will commence on 60 streetcars for the TTC and the refurbishment of 94 GO Transit cars. The union head is not alone in his belief that more could have been done to prevent the gap in production, including those in Queen's Park. The question is, why is this Premier doing nothing? And I'll tell you what we have done as a province, Mr. Speaker. We've invested into transit. Pasqualino has recently spoken to the NDP and Conservative parties looking to secure more work going forward. Discussing the issue with local MPP Judith Monteith Farrell just days ago. Premier, will you commit to a Made in Ontario transit strategy? And Speaker, through you, will the Premier do something to help the Alstom plant workers today? The answer is yes. This Premier has committed from the very beginning of our mandate to, to, to the uh, transit system, to the great people of Thunder Bay. Mayor Bill Morrow is disappointed but not surprised to hear of a gap in the cyclical workflow that is the Alstom plant and looks on the bright side to when things return to normal. A very difficult day for, for the workers and their families. I suppose some good news, we, there is more work that is coming, uh, but the numbers that we're at today around 400 or 430, you know, we're not going to see those numbers come back to the plant, I guess, until March of of 2023, they tell us. The period of unemployment will be just four months for some. Others may be without a job for a year, leaving Pasqualino worried that they will lose a portion of those skilled workers. It's a difficult decision. Do you stay or do you go? And, uh, you know, you might even be looking at leaving the community. And those are all hard decisions. And it just would have been a lot easier to have it signed a year earlier and just keep the flow going. Ideally, in Pasqualino's mind, the government invests heavily in subway infrastructure with enough work heading to Thunder Bay to secure a steady employment flow for years to come. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. Turning to COVID-19 now, hospitalizations are down today at the Regional Health Sciences Centre, dropping below 40 once again after the number of patients went up over the long weekend. There are 39 COVID patients being treated at the regional hospital, with the number of ICU cases dipping from 12 to 11. The hospital continues to operate above capacity at 103%. The occupancy rate in intensive care has held steady at 86%. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting 116 new cases since Tuesday. There are now 307 active cases, down from 342. As of Sunday, there were 45 people hospitalized across the district with 13 in intensive care. On the vaccine front, there were 1,781 doses administered across the TBDHU catchment area last week. More than 900 of those were third doses. According to the latest Ministry of Health numbers, 89% of people 5 and up have now received at least one shot, and nearly 85% have gotten at least two doses. The Northwestern Health Unit now has 308 active cases, up from 280 on Tuesday. Its latest numbers show six people in hospital as of last Friday, and the NWHU's seven-day test positivity rate has climbed above 29 percent. The Thunder Bay Health Coalition is fighting to stop privatized health care in Ontario. The local organization has joined the province-wide campaign after recent comments from Ontario's health minister, Christine Elliott. We're making sure that we can let independent health facilities operate, private hospitals. Well, that quickly caused a stir among many groups and health care unions across Ontario that oppose health care privatization. One of the largest concerns is the quality of care provided, with critics citing a higher mortality rate in privatized long-term care homes during the pandemic. 
Jules Tupker is chair of the Thunder Bay Health Coalition. He believes the Ford government is taking advantage of the pandemic. Oh, we're going to solve this problem for you. We're going to help you out with this. And we're going to create all these new private clinics that are going to get you your services a lot faster than you used to get it. You don't have to wait in line now. You can go to these private clinics and get this job done, which is wonderful if you can afford it. But there's so many people that cannot afford it, and we don't need that. Minister Elliott's office has responded, saying, quote, independent health facilities and private hospitals that perform publicly funded procedures already exist in Ontario. Her comments were in reference to the resumption of previously scheduled non-urgent procedures. The Ford government is changing its timeline when it comes to the provincial budget. And with the election just months away, it's raising some concerns from critics. Colin DeMello has a story. Mr. Speaker. Finance Minister. Back in 2019, as the Ford government delivered its first budget, then Finance Minister Vic Fideli offered a guarantee. The guarantee would, be, would require the Premier and the Minister of Finance to pay 10 per cent of their Premier and ministerial salaries for each missed public reporting deadline. That deadline meant the province had to table its budget before the end of March. Today, however, the Ford government revealed that guarantee is gone. The Progressive Conservative Party tabled new legislation to move the budget deadline from March to the end of April, saying because COVID-19 restrictions and financial supports are winding down, the government needs to reassess. So as we come out of that, review everything that, uh, where we are at, view economic forecasts, and we can uh, uh, put forward a budget that truly represents where we are as a province and where we are going. Moving the budget would give the government a springboard directly into the election campaign. And critics believe that's the true reason behind the move. This is pure political partisan pandering. Um, they've maneuvered uh, the budget date uh, because they're, they've stockpiled a lot of money that they received from the federal government. They're going to drop a lot of that money uh, in a budget and then they're going to go to an election. The province's former finance minister believes it could shield the government from accountability. Here we have an opportunity for the government, who has to be held accountable for the decisions they've made in the last four years, to illustrate what they're going to do in the next coming years, and they're delaying that review, they're delaying that proposal. Why? Because they probably want to also uh, ensure that they're able to make announcements without having it to be uh, costed, and that's an issue. But by moving the date, neither the Premier nor the Finance Minister will have to give up a cent of their salaries. Uh, At Queen's time. Park, Colin DeMello, CTV News. Impala Canada and Confederation College have partnered to train skilled workers for the mining industry. $120,000 in funding will help the college build a pipeline of talent for operations like Impala's Lactazil Mine north of Thunder Bay. Mitchell Ringos has the details. The investment from Impala Canada is meant to form the foundation of a unique partnership that will support the college and its students at several points in the post-secondary journey. From recruitment of young talent to tuition support and on-the-job training at the Lactazil Palladium Mine, Impala CEO Tim Hill explains the concept. It allows us to care for students and their families by helping them discover their potential and contribute to their communities. And it allows us to deliver to the next, the next generation of mining talent by filling our industry's pipeline with skilled individuals. College President Kathleen Lynch says they are excited to be able to intensify recruitment efforts over the next three years and attract both Indigenous and non-Indigenous students who may be interested in skilled trades and mining. This funding will create student bursaries and need-based financial support to provide opportunities to those who may not otherwise attain their aspiration to be a mechanic, millwright or engineer. The bursaries will soon be given to students in the electrical and instrumentation engineering and the millwright and heavy equipment mechanic programs. Confederation College student Andrew Morrison, who is taking the mechanical engineering technology program, says this financial help can be life changing. They're a helping hand at the perfect time, a full tank of gas and a vehicle of change, a fridge full of future knowledge and experience. It can mean the difference between struggling and thriving in many ways while a person is trying to succeed in their academic pursuits. And Impala Canada is not just giving this funding to the college and walking away. Instead, the company will be fully involved with the student's success, 
Impala Vice President Aaron Satterthway says it's essential these students have a clear line of sight to what skilled trades actually looks like in the mining industry. So we're committed to ensuring that students can come up to our mine site, can explore the operation, have access to our leadership team to talk about jobs and opportunities in the process. We're going to make sure that we're at Confederation College interviewing those students. So it's one thing for us to give funding and help you build a pipeline, but if we're not helping on the, the back end in recruiting that talent and giving them jobs, then the whole thing falls apart. Mitchell Ringos, TBT News. Fort William Gardens is getting ready to host its first concert since the pandemic began. Envy Music Hall is bringing Chicago rapper Polo G to Thunder Bay on May 19th, and the recent upgrades at the gardens have helped allow the show to happen. Vasilios Bellos reports. Polo G has quickly gained international attention, with his 2020 album The Goat peaking at number two on the Billboard 200. Along with this, the rapper has seen 10 singles on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. The show is taking place at the Fort William Gardens and is being put on by Envy Music Hall. Event organizer Han Marino is excited to bring a musician as popular as Polo G to Thunder Bay and is hoping for a sold-out show. I think that that would put Thunder Bay back on the map. You know, an artist like this usually goes to Toronto or Minneapolis. So to be able to see somebody... Um, you know, in this caliber, in our city, it's pretty amazing. So if it does sell out, this will put us back on the map and hopefully for more shows to come, right, in the future. Headley was the last concert to be held at the Gardens in 2014, and in the years since then, some significant upgrades have been made. It came at the cost of $1.1 million, federal and provincial funding helping with 80% of it. I just think this, this event does, is, uh, is something we're really excited about because it signals a, a return to concerts again. Paul Burke is the event services coordinator with the city and explains how these upgrades help big concerts to be held at Fort William Gardens. The rigging system, uh, load points, basically now there's a we can, we can again host uh, events where they need to, to hang sound systems and lights and such from, from the ceiling and uh, the electrical upgrade um, is, is more along the industry standards for, for concerts. And, after the last two years, what everybody has been through, we need something to celebrate, and I feel like this is going to help start a big celebration for Thunder Bay. Ticket sales for the Polo G concert open Friday at 10 a.m. and can be purchased at the Fort William Gardens website. Vasilios Bellows, TBT News. A Thunder Bay woman who always tries to help stray dogs find their homes got a big surprise last week. It turns out an animal that Melissa Miller encountered in West Fort was actually a coyote. Hi, sweetheart. Come here. Come here, baby. Miller saw the animal on a sidewalk in the Kingsway Brock Street area a short distance from her car, so she rolled down the window and called it over. The canine ran toward her, then abruptly turned into a yard. Someone who saw the video later informed her it was a coyote. Miller hadn't been made aware of any incidents involving coyotes attacking small dogs or people in the neighborhood. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry says they are wild animals and they should never be approached. Some Thunder Bay residents are still digging out after the latest dump of snow. Yesterday's snowfall was the fourth in the past week. And many people we spoke to today say they're running out of places to put it all. Jessa Clement reports. Thunder Bay residents have found themselves digging out again thanks to the latest snowfall. And as the snow banks and snow piles in people's yards get higher and higher, it's getting more difficult for residents to keep up clear in their driveways and finding places to put all the snow. Yeah, I'm not sure where I'm going to put this pile here on my left. I may just leave it and continually narrow my driveway so that I can just barely get out. Well, with a snowblower, I can blow it all the way back to the fence, but without that, my wife can't back out of the driveway because she can't see the uh, road. Uh, my husband has started a path, and so he started putting it around the side of the house so that we can still see to get out. While some people, such as skiers and snowmobilers, may be enjoying the excessive amount of snow, others are tired of shoveling and are eager for the warm weather that's soon to come. It's too much. Uh, it's getting to be a little bit much when it snows every day and every second day, and then the wind. Wind is a killer. For one thing, the shoveling, although to be honest, my husband does most of it, um, is, has been excessive. 
but we have an awesome snow fort in our front yard, so it's good and bad. I love snow, but uh, this is getting a bit um, cumbersome. <laughs> A lot of work. We've had enough snow this year and we've had enough cold weather, so I'm ready for it, things to warm up just a little bit more. While this latest snowfall probably won't be Thunder Bay's last, residents will be able to breathe a sigh of relief as the upcoming forecast calls for mainly clear skies for the next week. Jessica Clement, TBT News. Well, Fiona, you heard it there. Uh, the